it's, it's safe to come home. Don't be scared to come home. But she was gone like a whisper in the wind. Hello everyone, I'm Kevin and welcome to Just Thought Lounge. JTL is the true crime channel that delivers serious, well-balanced coverage of the cases that really make you think. We're about to take a look at an eight-year-old missing persons case out of Arkansas that has recently seen some pretty strange developments. When young teen Cassie Compton went missing near her home in autumn of 2014, it wasn't immediately clear that foul play was involved. Even Cassie's own mother thought that perhaps she had run off. In a few weeks, maybe she would return. But the circumstances did not add up, and both her mother Judy and Judy's live-in fiancé would become the center of an investigation. Was there foul play at home, or could Cassie have been taken by complete strangers? Years later, the internet believed they had discovered the truth. This is the strange case of Cassie Compton. Let's take a look. Stuttgart, Arkansas is a small farming community roughly 45 miles from Little Rock. The town is known as the duck and rice capital of the world. The town is surrounded by the Arkansas Grand Prairie, its rice fields draws the annual migration of ducks and geese, which makes it a destination for duck hunting from November to January each year. It is a quiet, rural community. In the autumn of 2014, 15-year-old Cassie Compton lived in Stuttgart with her mother Judy and Judy's fiance, a younger man named Brandon Rhodes. Judy, 42 years old at the time, had become engaged to 25-year-old Brendan roughly two years prior. It's unclear how the family supported themselves. Brendan was unemployed and Judy had an undisclosed disability. Cassie was homeschooled and working towards her GED. On Saturday afternoon, Cassie went with her friend Hunter Snyder and his mother Tracy to a demolition derby in DeWitt, about 40 miles from Stuttgart. After the derby, the group returned to Hunter's home where Cassie stayed the night. According to Tracy, Cassie was a regular fixture at the house. She would not disclose specifics, but she believed that Cassie used her house as a kind of escape, a safe haven from tensions and issues at her own home. That Sunday was spent having a relaxing day. They had a late lunch and no notable activities throughout the afternoon. Between 6 p.m. and 6.30, Hunter dropped Cassie off outside of her house. Hunter recalled that Brandon was home, out in the drive, he said, when Cassie was dropped off. She walked right past him to enter the house, but neither looked at or acknowledged him as she strode inside through the front door. That would be the last memory that Hunter made of his good friend Cassie. Judy was at home feeling extremely ill and resting in her bed when Cassie entered the house that evening. She heard the door and knew Cassie to be home. She could hear Cassie changing her clothing in the other room, but she did not leave her bed. She did not lay eyes on her daughter. A few minutes later, she heard the door again. Cassie had her phone in hand, as she often did when she went for walks. We know she left with her phone because she texted Hunter on her way out. She said that she was going to buy cigarettes. That text was sent at about 7 p.m. There are no witnesses that saw Cassie after she left her house. She was not spotted walking on the road, nor with anyone in a vehicle. I can't imagine. Where she went. I don't know if she even left the driveway. When she walked out the door, I don't know. You know, if she... Maybe was taken by somebody, you know, before she got out of the driveway. Less than three hours after Cassie sent her last text, Brandon Rhodes made the first of three calls to Tracy Snyder, expressing concern over Cassie's whereabouts. The first call was at 9.15 that evening. Brandon asked Tracy if Cassie was still with Hunter. Had she been dropped off? She had been, Tracy said. She had not seen Cassie since about 6 p.m. But why was Brandon asking if Cassie had been dropped off? Hunter had been certain that he had seen Brandon just outside the house when Cassie walked in. Surely Brandon saw her enter the house. He would call twice more that evening to check in. Tracy told him to contact the police, which Brandon claimed to have done, or rather he said that he had attempted. 
Lacking a driver's license, Brendan rode his bike to the police station that night, but when he explained the circumstances, he claims that he was told that he could not file a missing person report until a 72-hour period had passed. This despite the fact that Cassie was only 15 years old. But she was gone like a whisper in the wind. From this point, the versions of events offered by those involved begin to diverge. Judy did not get out of bed until after 8 p.m. Specifically, she said she arose at 8, 12 p.m. Judy originally told law enforcement that when Cassie came home, Brandon was in the kitchen preparing dinner, which he later served to her in bed as she was too ill to get up and eat at the table. Brandon claimed that he also did not set eyes on Cassie in the few minutes that she was at the house despite Hunter's recollection of him being out front and witness to Cassie's return. Brandon said he remained in the bedroom caring for Judy the entire time. Not so, according to Judy, who also reported that around that exact period of time, Brendan declared his intention to pop to the store. He was out of cigarettes. Sometime later, Brendan returned home. He went straight to the bathroom and was sick, reportedly for hours, according to Judy. However, we know that he emerged by 9.15 p.m. that night to call Tracy to check in on Cassie. She said he told her he was leaving and he was going to get cigarettes. But at the same time that he goes to get cigarettes, Cassie Compton texts his hunter and says, I'm going to get a smoke. Mm -hmm. Red flag. Which She's never seen again. Well, you know, I, my, my concern here is did she get in the car with him and it was a thing like, hey, I'm going to get smokes and knowing if anything, I'm not going to say he did anything to her because I do not know, but you put two and two together. He's gone to get cigarettes and she's gone to get cigarettes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, something is just not right there. He was gone. And after he came back, he went in the bathroom and was sick and stayed in the bathroom for an hour or two. On Monday morning, Tracy checked in on the status of Cassie's missing persons inquiry. At that time, she came to learn that no such report had been made. There was no record of Brandon's visit the night before. So Tracy filed a missing persons report herself. Judy has also claimed to be the person to have made this report. Regardless, by Monday morning, there was an investigation underway and volunteers began coordinating searches. At that time, Judy told the press that there was absolutely no reason why Cassie would have run away from home on her own accord. She would later suggest that that was a possibility. 24 hours after the report was made, there had been no Amber Alert issued. Phil, so far Cassie's case falls short of an Amber Alert, but her mother tells me there's no reason to believe her daughter ran away. That's why multiple law enforcement agencies are coming together to get to the bottom of this. After several weeks with no sign of Cassie, Judy and Brendan ended their relationship. Judy stated she thought Cassie would not return home while Brendan was still there, but that she believed that Cassie would come back if he was no longer in the picture. Investigators had seized cell phones from both Judy and Brandon. Location data from one of these devices led to extensive searches in the area surrounding the Stuttgart Municipal Airport. Over 250 individuals from law enforcement as well as community volunteers gathered at the airport and divided into teams to grid search the surrounding area, on ATVs, on horseback, and on foot. Other search parties were arranged closer to the Compton home, starting from one block away and working outwards. Railroad tracks behind RW Manufacturing and wooded areas two blocks from Cassie's home became focal points. The locations were speculated to be based around areas that Brandon had been seen or frequented when riding his bicycle near the edge of town and local reservoirs. The FBI and state police joined the investigation several weeks after Cassie went missing. A tip to police led to the discovery of a collection of items thought to have been purposefully left under Bayamita Bridge, approximately 15 miles from Casco, in an area of interest for the search parties. These items were thought to have been left near the creek under the bridge on October 3rd, roughly two weeks following Cassie's disappearance. They included a half-drank Gatorade bottle, two men's shirts, men's toiletries, including shaving cream, two folded drapes, a girl's hugs and kisses sweater, a teddy bear, and two carrying bags. If these items could be directly linked to Cassie, it's unclear exactly how. 
A separate group searched the town cemetery based on reported information that a neighborhood resident had called police to report Brendan loitering and snooping in the area. It was also known that although Brendan did not have a driver's license, he nonetheless would drive Judy's car on occasion, particularly when she was resting and seemingly unaware. The car was searched, so was the house. If there was anything found to indicate what had happened to Cassie, it wasn't reported. Brendan Rhodes found himself in trouble with the law on a regular basis over the following years. Beginning in fact only a few short weeks after his split with Judy when he was found squatting in an abandoned home and was jailed for 100 days. Meanwhile, Judy continued to give interviews to the local press and maintain hope for Cassie's safe return. In what must have been intended as a cruel joke, Judy was contacted directly by someone claiming to be Cassie on her messaging app some two years after her daughter went missing. Still hopeful that Cassie was out there somewhere, she admitted that at first, she believed she was messaging with her daughter. This cruel prank was not the only thing offering hope to Judy in the years following Cassie's disappearance. The Find Cassie Compton Facebook group and Judy's own account are littered with articles and other news reports of lost teens that had fallen victim to trafficking operations in and around Arkansas. In some instances, the victims were later found alive and returned to their families. In autumn 2021, an unsettling video of a woman sitting in the backseat of a car flanked by two men who appeared to be rapping made its way around TikTok and then saw a second wave of popularity on Facebook. The young woman appeared to be in her late teens or early 20s. She had darkened eyes, likely dyed black hair, and a disturbing and ominous stare. Viewers on the platform began to question who this woman was. How did she come to be in the car? Why does she not break her gaze from the camera? And is she okay? An image of Cassie progressed to age 19 had been developed and widely circulated, and the resemblance between this image and the woman in the video is striking. Oh no, <laughs> good one, plenty of eggs. He ready to have plenty of come across my Facebook story and I keep wondering who is this girl? Where is she? Why does she look so lost? Why is her eyes so black? And why are people just laughing in the background? I, I was thinking my poor baby, she looks beat up. She looked strung out. It was it was shocking for me to see. I started bawling and thinking, oh, my poor baby girl. The connection between the video woman and Cassie went viral. Commentators online, but also in the greater media, began to declare Cassie found. A missing person case solved by TikTok was the headline. With the exposure that this received, the FBI stepped in and released a statement confirming that they were exploring the lead and trying to determine if this perplexing woman was, in fact, Cassie Compton. The FBI Little Rock office confirming just a few moments ago that the photo you see there on the left hand side of your screen is being investigated right now. This is a screenshot from a video because there are many speculating that this could be and I want to emphasize could be missing Stuttgart girl Cassie Compton. Unfortunately for Judy Compton, the viral video provided nothing more than further false hope. The woman was soon identified as Haley Grace Phillips, a Los Angeles resident who had, in fact, been missing for a few days. Haley took to Instagram to clear up the confusion, insisting to those who still believed that she was Cassie under a fake identity, that she was a real person. She explains that the video was taken shortly after she had been mugged, but her eyes were healing. Although it did little to quell all of the associated rumors that Haley was nonetheless being trafficked, she told her followers she was doing just fine. Thank you everybody for worrying, but, um, and also thank you for making me post a picture of me with my recovering black eyes. I was robbed this weekend, I'm fine, okay? I'm not kidnapped. And this is my phone and I'm real and this is a real account, so everyone stop bothering me. I don't know who this Cassie bitch is, but I'm Haley Grace. Okay, and I'm fine. 
all of a sudden these people I don't know are concerned about me. I never even met any of you guys in my life and you're all worried about me. And then you're talking about how it looks suspicious. How does it look suspicious if you don't even know who the f I am? <laughs> I understand there's a video going around TikTok and Facebook and people are genuinely concerned. I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just trying to explain the situation and let everybody know I'm safe and I'm fine. And if I was in danger, I wouldn't have a problem reaching out. The TikTok confusion had brought with it a renewed attention to Cassie's missing persons case and by extension, renewed suspicion of the main suspect, Brandon Rhodes. While in custody at Independence County Jail under various charges including conspiracy to commit capital murder in an unrelated case, Brendan agreed to speak with a local investigative journalist about Cassie's case. In a handwritten letter, Brendan wrote that he would do whatever it takes to bring closure to Judy and once and for all bring Cassie's case to a close. Because there is only so much a man can keep bottled up inside of him. It's time the truth was presented to everyone. The letter was immediately turned over to local law enforcement. Although the language Brandon used was incriminating, it was a far cry from a confession. More was needed. Brandon had agreed to talk. When the reporter went to the jail for visitation, however, she and the private investigator were turned away. Despite verification from the online records that he was being held in custody, a phone call directly to the jail for verification the day before, and Brandon's own statement within the letter, the jail claimed he was not being held there. A few days later, another letter was received. In this one, Brandon claimed to have been in the county jail the entire time, and he stated that he was unaware of the attempt to visit and speak with him. He asked for another visit, but this time, it seems, he was not interested in offering any specifics about Cassie, but he did leave an impression. He was talking about how people think he's a psychopath. And that was kind of interesting to me too. He asked me what I think makes a psychopath. And he was going on and on and on about how it's pain that creates a psychopath. And then when I asked him, well, are you, do you, are you a sociopath, psychopath? He's like, what, no, what? But he's staring me dead in the eye, trying to intimidate me yeah. into basically believing he's a psychopath, I think. Brendan Lee Rhodes remains the only suspect in the disappearance of Cassie Compton, but he has never been charged. In a recent interview with Judy, she rejects the possibility that Brendan could have had anything to do with the disappearance. She doesn't entertain the possibility that he would have harmed her. I never thought that he would have anything to do with it. He looked at her like his daughter, you know? And if he did, it would be shocking to me. Judy remarried in 2021. She still holds out hope that Cassie will be found and that they will be reunited. The investigative report that led to Brandon's jailhouse interview was also developed into an eight-part podcast called Timeline, The Disappearance of Cassie Compton, which is available on the standard platforms. If you have any information on Cassie's disappearance or believe that you have seen Cassie anywhere other than TikTok, the contacts for law enforcement and placing anonymous tips are in the description of this video. In 2022, Cassie would be 23 years old. She is approximately 5 foot 3 with brown hair, sometimes dyed blonde, and blue eyes. Thanks for watching. I'm Kevin. This is Just Thought Lounge, and I'll see you in the next one.